being alive is kind of a lot of work. And if I'm being completely honest with you guys, some days I just don't really feel up to it. Getting up, taking a shower, eating, doing all the things, getting dressed, driving to work. There are days when that just feels like so much. And that's really frustrating because then there's other days where I wake up and I'm like, yep, I got this today. No problem. But some days it just feels like such a burden to do the basic stuff that I have to do to stay operational, for lack of a better term. And that's just the body, too. I mean, if you get into what our brains need to stay healthy and functional, that's a hundred times more complicated. And I probably just triggered every physician who watches this channel and they're now going to unsubscribe. But as a psychologist, brains are giant pain in the butt to deal with. They're just, they're inconsistent. They're unpredictable. They're illogical. That's the worst part. Because logic literally comes from our brains, yet our brains are illogical. Make that make sense to me. In all seriousness, sometimes being alive feels more like a burden than a gift. And I hate that I feel that way. Like, I say those words out loud and I hate that I say them because I don't want that to be true. Because I don't actually believe that that is true. But I feel that way sometimes. And having your thoughts and your feelings on a completely different page of life is a really difficult thing to figure out what to do with. I thankfully don't feel that way nearly as often as I used to. And I think for the most part, that is because I have discovered and continue to use a series of strategies that makes existence a lot more tolerable for me. Now, these strategies are specifically designed for people who experience things like depression, anxiety, or other mood or anxiety disorders, because those add some layers of complexity to what it takes to take care of ourselves. And that's, you know, so much of what we talk about on this channel, on this podcast, is essentially how to take care of yourself as a person living with one or more mental illnesses, because it is more important, but also more difficult to take excellent care of yourself if you have a chronic mental health condition or multiple chronic mental health conditions. So more important and hard, which means we are probably going to need a special set of strategies, a, a different rule book than what most of humanity has to play by in order to, you know, kind of make it to the end of the day and make ends meet in order to be sustainable, in order to live in a way that we can get up and do it tomorrow and the day after and the day after. Before we get into the three strategies I want to define for you today, I want to make sure we're clear what it is I am talking about, because this is a little bit different than just like, oh, I'm tired. Oh, I'm unmotivated. This is like, I don't completely care to be alive today. Like I'm indifferent to existence right now. I'll give you a silly example of this. Well, it's not silly. It's the subject matter is kind of silly, but it, it, it's a very serious feeling. One of the biggest I guess I would say fights that I ever got into with my mom, and there were more of them than there should have been. Sorry, mom. One of the biggest fights I ever got into with my mom was, of all things, over parking brake. We live, they still live, they, they kind of live on a hill. And so once multiple children in the home uh, had vehicles, a lot of us had to park on the street, which means we were parked on the hill with our cars just like pointing downhill, right? And my mom noticed that I didn't set my parking brake. And one, I think it was breakfast, one morning at breakfast, she, she assumed I didn't know how, which I don't think I did. But that's not the point. She was giving me instructions on how to set the parking brake. And I'm like 17 or something in the story. And I said something along the lines of like, mom, I don't care. She thought I meant like, I don't care how to learn the parking brake. And so she was trying to explain to me, like, if you don't set the parking brake, your car might roll down the hill and like crash and become not operational. So you should care because bad things will happen to you and your belongings if you don't do this thing. She didn't understand. And, and I don't blame her because this doesn't make a lot of sense if you've never experienced it. She didn't understand what I meant when I said, I don't care. I didn't mean I don't care because I don't understand that if I don't do this, I might not have a car. What I meant was I don't care about anything that happens in my life. I don't care if I have a car because pretty much the only things that I use my car for are to go to work and to go to school. I don't care about any of those things. I don't care what happens to me. I don't care what my future is. I don't care if this works out or not. Like, I am not enjoying life and I'm, I'm not having a good time. And so the idea of losing something that enables me to do the life things that I don't care to do 
It's really not scary to me. That's what I meant when I said I don't care. I just did not want to do anything at that point in my life. I I was indifferent about whether or not I actually like wanted to live or die, but I didn't want to participate in life. I didn't want to participate in society. I didn't want to be a part of the world. I was okay being alive in theory. I just didn't want to do any of the things that I had to do to make that sustainable long term. I wanted to just opt out of all the things. And for a long time, I basically did that. I, I did literally the absolute bare minimum level of functioning that a person can do to like not just die of self-neglect, basically. Um, and that's all I did for years because I didn't see a purpose or a value in doing anything more than that. Like I said, that is not something I experience very often these days. And so today I'm going to share with you the three most important things I have learned on my journey from there to here that I believe have helped me stay out of that mindset and stay in a place where I generally don't mind being alive and doing, you know, basic self-care things. So the first rule that I try to live by is I try not to live only for myself. This, I think, was the biggest mistake that I was making at that point in my life. There are many reasons that I don't think we should live only for ourselves. And let me just, before I get to the reasons, let me acknowledge something with that. I understand that that might be very frustrating to hear. I think I remember people telling me things like that when I was in that place in my own life. And I remember hating it because I remember thinking something along the lines of like, I am miserable. I don't know how I'm supposed to find enjoyment or fulfillment or satisfaction in this life. No one else seems to know how I'm supposed to do these things either. I feel like it's unlikely that anyone figures it out for me, but if anyone's going to figure it out, I am probably the most likely candidate. And I need to focus on myself to figure those things out. And so you're telling me I shouldn't do the only thing that I think might get me out of this. And, and I'm not saying you shouldn't think about yourself. I'm not saying you shouldn't care about yourself. I'm not saying you shouldn't live in a way that helps you. And in fact, I absolutely believe you should do all of those things, but you shouldn't do only those things. And there are many reasons for that. Perhaps the biggest one is if you have a cyclical mood disorder, no matter what you do, how hard you try, how disciplined you are, you are going to hit times when you don't matter to you. That's that's part of depression and that's part of anhedonia is you don't care how good your life is. You don't care how much stuff you have. You don't care how many people love you because if your ability to emotionally connect with all of those things outside of yourself can vanish, at least temporarily, at a moment's notice, then you cannot solve this problem by stacking as much of those things as possible. Those things will help you during a better phase of life, when you're feeling relatively good, when you're not in the midst of a crippling, severe, depressive episode, then you'll think they're great. They're wonderful. And they give you motivation and they give you joy and they make you want to keep going. But what about the times when you can't feel them? What about the time, the times when throwing all your time and energy only into yourself basically feels like you're throwing coins into a black hole rather than like a wishing fountain. That was a weird metaphor. So I hope you guys know what I mean. Sometimes inside, we just become this black hole. And no matter what you put into it, nothing good happens. It just disappears. It just gets sucked into the void. And so if that's where everything you have is going, there's going to be times when that does nothing for you. So if that's all you have, you're going to need to expand that a little bit. What should you expand it to? That's not really my business to tell you. And that's not me being coy. That's me not knowing all the details of your life or who you are as a person. Um, but, you know, that could be spirituality. That could be career. That could be a partner. That could be children. That could be volunteer opportunities. It could be pets. It could be the environment. It could be politics. It could be creativity. I mean, the options are basically endless here. And this is just, these are super broad ideas that are just scratching the surface, right? But if it's all just staying inside, there's going to be times when you feel completely hollow and empty. If you are also investing in things outside of yourself, living for more than just you, you may still not connect 
with those purposes emotionally during severe depressive episodes that you will at least logically be able to say, I know that like I'm making some wise choices here. I know that some of my resources are being allocated towards something that does matter. For some reason, I don't know why this is. I would love for someone to explain this to me. Maybe you guys know. If you have any theories, let me know in the comments. For some reason, it seems like our ability to care about and for ourselves is hit much more severely by depression than our ability to care for other things or people. I don't know if there's a scientific reason for that, but like I can have periods of time where I just do not care one single bit about myself, but I have never been so depressed that I didn't care about my kids, for example. I don't know why that is. And I didn't realize that question was going to enter my mind before I started filming this episode. So um, yeah, if you guys have any thoughts on that, let's make this little conversation in the comments. Let me know what you think. Super curious about that one. But again, bullet point summary, number one, find something, ideally multiple things. Because if, if it's just one thing, depending on what it is, there might be periods of time where it's not available to you. But, but try to have something in this world that matters to you other than just you. Because when you have a chronic mental health condition, you are unpredictable. Again, I don't mean that judgmentally. I just mean your inner emotional world is one of turmoil. It's, ones of a, it's one of a lot of ups and downs. And it's one that you can't always count on. So if you have things outside of yourself that you can count on, you know, to be more stable or more predictable than your feelings, that can be like an inference storm, so to speak, you know, something that keeps you grounded, keeps you on the right track when you're all over the place. And uh, I know that I've needed that. And I suspect most people who have felt how I felt probably also need that. Second rule I try to live by that helps me get through these patches when I just don't really care is I have trained myself to operate for an extended period of time in the absence of an emotional reward. That, that is really what's at the core of all three of these, is during these periods of time when we get that black hole, void, empty feeling, we have to figure out ways to continue to live and continue to do things when we aren't feeling what we would normally feel under those circumstances. We're mammals. There's no getting around that fact. Mammals are reward-based creatures. We really only do things for one of two reasons, to move towards a desired outcome or to move away from an undesired outcome. That, those two principles basically explain all of human behavior. That's the, if you look at your day and what you spend time and energy on, almost everything is for one of those two reasons. And those reasons get very disrupted when the reward part kind of goes bye-bye for a while. But it doesn't have to. Because if you have learned that this is just a thing that happens to me sometimes, sometimes I just don't feel what I know I should be able to feel from the things that I have, from the things that I'm doing, from the fill in the blank with whatever matters to you in life. It won't disappear forever. If we're talking about anhedonia, which is what I'm referring to in this episode, if you're experiencing anhedonia from a depressive episode, it doesn't last forever. So when you have those empty periods, try not to panic. Try not to flip your entire life upside down. Try not to stop doing the things that you logically know are beneficial for you to continue doing just because you no longer connect with them emotionally because it will come back. These are episodes that occur as a component of an episodic mood disorder. And by definition, every episode will lift at some point. That doesn't mean you'll feel amazing. It doesn't mean all your problems will be solved. It means you'll feel better at some point in the future. It's essentially I'm talking about delayed gratification here because if we can't feel an immediate reward, we can predict and trust. Hard word, I know. Like, trust is tricky when, when you're unpredictable internally. But if you can trust, okay, I don't feel this right now, but I believe that if I keep doing these things, I'll get there. This feeling will come to me eventually, as long as I don't stop. As long as I don't stop taking care of myself. As long as I don't stop doing the things that I believe are important. As long as I don't stop using my tools, using my coping skills. As long as I don't stop... You know, spending time with my loved ones, again, fill in the blank with whatever your thing is. 
it'll come back. Unless you stop doing it, it won't. That's what gets us into so much trouble. I've talked about this in another episode, and this is just my phrasing. And I'm trying to think of a less judgy way to say it. It sounds judgy. But I, I legitimately believe that there are two types of depressive episodes. There are medical depressive episodes where your internal brain chemistry and physiology shifts and you feel and function differently because of that shift. And then there's what I call false depression. I don't mean that you're faking it. I mean, when a depressive episode hits you, especially a severe depressive episode, you often stop doing all the things that make you not feel depressed. Because if you don't feel any different when you do them, it's hard to operate in the absence of reward. And if you stop doing those things, eventually that depressive episode ends. But if you are no longer doing anything that makes you feel good or gives you a sense of meaning or purpose, and you're still living like a severely depressed person, even after the episode has ended, you will continue to feel like a severely depressed person, even after the episode has ended. The difference is it's now not a reflection of your inner biology and neurology. It's a reflection of your actual life that you're living because you're living like a depressed person. And if you live like a depressed person, even if you don't actually experience depression, you will eventually experience depression. And a lot of the people who tell me like, no, I have eternal depression. Like it does not lift. There's no episodes. It's just always like this. This might be the reason. And I say this with all the love, respect, and empathy in the world. Please know that. You've got to shift out of that mode of functioning when you're able to. Or it will last forever, but it doesn't have to. Sometimes it's going on and on and on because you weren't doing anything to change how you feel. And I know that it's easier said than done. But if you can train yourself to at least maintain that bare minimum level of functioning, and even when you feel absolutely nothing from it, that will decrease the frequency, the duration, and probably even the severity of these episodes. It can flip the ratio upside down. It, it, this can be the thing that makes you go from, I am almost always depressed other than when like the stars align and I have basically a perfect day to the complete opposite. Almost always okay other than when like everything falls apart all at once. We all have those days. I'll have those days. You'll have those days. But if the only times you really get brought down to those depths are on those days where you just, where it's just all the stuff. It's like everything, you guys know what I'm talking about, everything that could have gone wrong today did. Those days are going to suck. There's nothing you can do about it. But if those are the only days you feel that way, that's a night and day difference. And being able to sustain functioning with delayed gratification is crucial to flipping those ratios around. The third rule I try to live by, and this might sound very similar to the second one. They're, again, they're all on the same, they're all based on the same foundational principles. So there's, there's some common DNA with all three of these. But I do believe they're worth separating because they kind of land differently, at least in my brain. The third is do not function on emotion alone. There is a, a DDT, dialectical behavior therapy, concept called wise mind. And it's it's a Venn diagram. So a Venn diagram is just the two circles and then they overlap in the middle, right? So the two uh, independent circles are reason mind and emotion mind. Person functioning on reason mind would use only, you know, logic and, and statistics and objective data to make their decisions. That's not necessarily good either. Person living in emotion mind goes just based on how things feel in the moment. Both of those extremes can lead us astray at times. And a good example is a job. Like, let's say you're picking between two different jobs. Say so you have two job offers. Person in reason mind would just look at, like, the salary, the benefits, the hours, the commute, and basically turn this into a math equation. Which job is superior numerically? The emotion-minded person would go based on, you know, what vibe did I get while I was there? How did the environment feel? Did I enjoy talking to the coworkers and, and, and isn't going to look at the numbers at all? Both of those approaches can end up putting you in a really tough spot. Um, but wise mind is the area in the middle where they overlap. Tricky thing with depression and anxiety is our emotions often either, like they go to both extremes. Sometimes our emotions get bigger, stronger, scarier than what most people experience. And sometimes they're gone. Like sometimes they're just absent completely. Um, it's relatively easy not to make decisions based on emotions when you don't have them. Or, or you might think, but 
in a weird way, the absence of emotion still kind of is emotion. And I, I hope this makes sense because it's kind of like metaphysical-ish, but also don't make decisions based on the absence of emotion. So like extreme example, let's say that you hit a severe depressive episode that includes complete total anhedonia. Like I don't feel anything good from any stimuli in my life. And let's say, let's say that you're me, you're a 40 year old married man. And, and because of the depth and the severity of this depression, it's so bad that you don't even experience the feeling of love for your partner that you normally do under circumstances when your brain is working correctly. Do not interpret that. Do not give that meaning other than at the most basic level. I am in a depressive episode. I am experiencing anhedonia and I'm unable to feel those connections right now. Do not interpret that as I have fallen out of love with my wife and I should get divorced and try to find someone I actually love. Because if those feelings are coming from anhedonia and a depressive episode, they're going to come back. And you're going to feel really upset with yourself when you try to put those pieces back together. So if you know that your emotions are being manipulated by a mental illness, do not put them in the driver's seat of your life. I know that's like the million dollar thing. And gosh, if we could just do that, our mental illnesses wouldn't really cause us any problems. I know, I know it's not as simple as snap your fingers, flip the switch in your brain, stop doing it. But you do have to start with just the basic knowledge that my emotions are not always trustworthy because they don't always correlate with what's actually present in my life. And therefore, I cannot make them the sole decision makers in my life and in my future because they will lead me horribly astray at times when they lose connection with the outer world. I'm not saying become a robot and make everything a spreadsheet because that has downsides too. I've kind of tried that and it, the way things look on paper and the way they actually play out, not always the same thing. But don't let your emotions be the sole reason you do things. If you have, I mean, I, think, I really don't think anyone should do that, honestly, but definitely don't do it if you have a mental illness, because your emotions can be a little out of touch with your actual life sometimes. You can't always trust them. So these three rules, living by them has dramatically reduced the amount of times and the duration of time when it does happen that I feel like just being alive is a burden that's not worth shouldering. It's almost non-existent for me now. And even when it does happen, because I know these rules, it really doesn't cause any problems in my life other than it's I'm stealing yet another Dave Ramsey quote and I'm not even nearly as big of a Dave Ramsey fan as that might suggest I just find him to be very quotable um I forgot the quote now because I said too many things about Dave Ramsey he's talking about having money and savings I had to look it up my brain just did not cooperate there and Dave Ramsey says when you have an emergency fund built up crises become inconveniences. So he's referring to things like, you know, dishwasher breaks and you and you have no money in savings, that's a crisis, right? If you have money in savings and you can pay for the repair, like it's, it's still not a fun thing to go through, but you're like, well, that's too bad, but I can deal with it. That's kind of what these rules help me do with my brain. When my feelings are chaotic or unpredictable or absent, it's no longer, oh my gosh, my life is falling apart, everything's terrible, what can I do? How do I fix this? It's, uh, really? Right now? Oh, okay, just let's, let's just get this over with as quickly as possible. I'm ready to move on from this. Let's, let's get this done. And I'll probably make a good video or two out of it because I'll remember what this feels like and I'll talk to people about it and I'll work through my feelings with my audience. So thank you guys for listening and I'll see you next time. I hope this helps. Take care.